aging is a continuity of, um, of our being called, our vocation. And I think as a Christian, I believe that God is calling us uh, all our lives. And that uh, that doesn't stop when we're 65 or when we're 75 or when we're 80, uh, but God is continually calling us. And that, that is something we need to remember and to, um, and, and, and to be aware of. The examples of aging that are important. Uh, one struck me as I thought about this uh, was a woman named Janet, who was elderly, who was one of my older students. Uh, and she had had a very interesting career. She, uh, when she was very small, she you know, said, went to her mother and said, Mother, I, I know what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be a priest. And her mother slapped her and said, Don't you know that only, only uh, men can be priests? And so she felt rather bad about that. But she then began a long career. She was, uh, did various jobs during, she was, she was a nun for a time in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but she still had this, this self feeling that she ought to become ordained. And so she became, when she became an Episcopalian, she went to the bishop, and uh, the bishop was uh, very solicitous of her, and they looked over her papers and said, well, I see you haven't finished college. We can't accept you if you haven't done that. Which, of course, could have been waived for a lot of people, uh, particularly her age. But uh, Janet went and said, okay. <laughs> in, in a year and a half, she finished her college credits, got her college degree, went to the bishop again and said, well, you, know, you really have to have at least a, a Master of Arts in Religion in order to be ordained. So she said, okay. So, so she went back, to, she went to seminary and uh, got her Master of Arts in, in Religion uh, and went back. And finally, he had no reason to, to turn her down and he, he ordained her at 64. Right. <laughs> so Janet had about two years of active ministry uh, before she died. And, um, but, uh, but, she, but she was persistent, she stayed with it, and that quality of persistence, that persistence of really, or that sense of knowing where you're called and having the will and the, the vision to follow through on that is something many older people can teach us. I think the end of life issues are so critical for our church. Uh, for many people, they have a difficult time initiating that conversation with their families. Uh, it's rather awkward to come home one day to the family and say, you know, I've been thinking about the way that I want to die or the way that I want my body to be arranged. It's just a very awkward conversation for people to have. But I think that churches are the natural place to facilitate those conversations and to allow people to express their wishes in a safe and comforting environment that doesn't make it sound as if, you know, your death is maybe immediately imminent, but just, you know, portraying it in a more spiritual way that, you know, these are my wishes for how I would like to be cared for, you know, in the event that, uh, you know, the end of my life approaches unexpectedly. And I think that we as a church have a lot to say about that, both from a spiritual standpoint but also just from a practical standpoint. It, it reduces greatly the strain on families to know in advance what their loved ones would have wanted to, to have done, whether that's you know, life support or funeral arrangements. And I think the other thing that, that the church can really uh, address in terms of uh, end of life issues is this whole notion of healing versus curing. The medical establishment is so uh, concerned with curing people. You know, you have cancer and, and it's only successful if we eradicate the cancer and put it into remission. Whereas I think the church can really speak to issues of, we may not be able to eradicate the cancer, but we may be able to allow you to have a spiritual experience through the cancer, to learn some things about yourself, to teach some things to the people around you, and to really make it um, maybe if not a positive experience, certainly a rewarding experience from a spiritual perspective. And so healing is very different than curing. And I think so many times as we uh, focus on the medical problems and the, and the medical side of it, we forget that there's also a spiritual component to our physical health. And so I, I think that that's where the church really should have more to say and should really take more initiative in trying to get those conversations going. Lifelong Christian formation is the acknowledgement that we as people are consistently being formed by God into who we're called to be. Um, it is a process of education, but it is really involves our whole selves and our deepening relationship with God. If someone experiences Christian formation and lifelong formation by everything that we do, both inside the church doors and in our lives. Um, 
worship is a part of formation, education is a part of formation, our outreach activities are a part of formation, our pastoral care to each other are all a part of Christian formation. We can help children respond to aging issues in a number of different ways. One of the first messages that we as a church really need to embrace is the fact that aging is a part of being human. The process of aging is something that God created in us. And if God created us as very good, then aging is also very good. The first idea that young people really need to learn is that aging is a part of who we are. And with aging comes some special gifts, but also some real challenges for young people. Um, it is extraordinarily difficult for young people when they lose a grandparent, or when they lose an older adult in their community who very much functions as a grandparent. Um, the great thing about faith communities is that you can end up with a whole host of grandparents, but it does mean that we have some particular conversations to have about loss. There are some really wonderful resources out there, but some of the most important things that we can do as adults is to acknowledge their pain uh, and to not shy away from their pain as we shy away from our own sometimes, but to acknowledge, I know that you're hurting and to have a place where you can talk and talk about that and encourage them to pray and be in conversation with not only you, but with other adults in their community and with God. The teachable moment um, for aging for young people is really not any different than the teachable moment for us as people of God about aging. Um, th this is part and parcel of who God made us as. And God didn't make us as perfect beings. God made us perfect in our imperfectness. So wrinkles, gray hair, um, all of these things that come with having been on the planet, having been engaged in this very unique relationship with God and with our communities are a part of who we are. And they're a very important part of who we are and we need to hold them up as a gift from God. Lifelong formation for the aging, um, that's really very, very, um, it's complicated because we're all at different places and there's no, no two of us who are identical. And I have still a lot to learn and that's what I look for for me personally in a parish is a parish where I have some opportunities to learn and to grow and to continue to expand my knowledge because I really have minimal knowledge when I sit back and look at the vast amount that there is. And, but I've, I've become very aware of things like Fowler's stages of faith and a number of other uh, sources that really um, emphasize the fact that we all develop differently in our faith journeys. And then there's some people who have no, no identity in a faith journey at the end of their lifespan. And so all of those things, so there's room for evangelism as well as development of um, programs.